Good morning, everybody. It is indeed great to see you here on a beautiful Sabbath morning. I am so happy that you have chosen to worship with us today. It's a little dark outside because it's actually Friday evening as I'm recording this instead of sometime earlier in the week. Usually it's earlier in the afternoon, but several things got in the way. I hope that you all had a wonderful and beautiful and great Thanksgiving. It is indeed my favorite holiday. I wish we could celebrate Thanksgiving more often. And really, in reality, Thanksgiving or giving thanks to God is our ultimate form of worship that we can do both on an individual level and a corporate level. And so this morning, my sermon title, as you just saw on the screen a moment ago, is The People of God. Our scripture reading will come from Isaiah chapter 25, verse 4, if you want to turn to that. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 4. I do not have any of the texts on a PowerPoint. I am going to use a PowerPoint for two slides for a specific purpose. And I realize that the one's going to be a little bit hard to see. But, I but, but it'll make an, a, a good point that I'm trying to make. So Isaiah chapter 25, verse 4, we'll have our prayer in just a little bit. We will do our scripture reading in just a little bit. Psalms number 90, Psalms 90, marks the beginning of the fourth book of Psalms. For those wondering, the book of Psalms is divided into five or broken down into five sections or five books. They are as follows. Book 1 contains the first 41 psalms and ends in Psalms chapter 41, verse 13. It deals specifically, though that group of songs, psalms deals specifically with humanity. The content is personal in nature and roughly corresponds with the book of Genesis. I'm not saying that it completely is within the book of Genesis, or Genesis is within that particular, but aspects of that refer back to an understanding of the book of Genesis. Book 2 consists of the next 31 Psalms, from chapters 42 to chapter 72, verses 18 and 19 are the uh, doxology, or the ending of that particular song, psalm, and it consists mainly of deliverance. They are devotional in nature and roughly correspond, interestingly enough, with the book of Exodus. Book 3 contains the next 17 psalms from chapter 73, verses 89, verse 52. And I may have done that wrong, but I think that is correct. They deals mainly, those psalms deal mainly with the sanctuary, they are liturg litur I can't all of a sudden can't say it liturgical. There we go. And historical in nature, roughly corresponding, strangely enough, with the book of Leviticus. And book four also contains 17 psalms from chapters 90 through chapter a book 106, chapter 106 verse 48, dealing with the reign of God, they are general in nature and roughly correspond with the book of Numbers. He's beginning to see a parallel here with the, the construction of the Psalms and the construction of Moses' law as written out in the first five books of the Bible, because you guessed it, book five deals with uh, 44 psalms from 107 to Psalms 150. The Word of God is the primary focus of this section. It's awfully lot of God speaking to us. The Word of God is the primary focus of this section. The contents is both prophetic in nature and also contains a large section which is Psalms 119, on regarding the law and God's love toward the law and our love toward the law, and roughly corresponds, interestingly enough, with Deuteronomy, which means the second law or the law of the land. The theme of Psalms is God, 
worship for and to of God and what he, God, has done for us, but it is also properly portrays humanity's wrestling with and trying to understand God and why certain things happen in this world that we just don't understand. Within the Psalms, Jesus Christ is anticipated, portrayed, and prophesied, excuse me, in such images as the coming King, the coming Redeemer, the loving shepherd, and the righteous sufferer. This morning, our focus of the study will be Psalms chapter 91, the second psalm in the fourth book. Many believe that the psalms in the fourth book were psalms that were written as encouragement to those that were in exile or returning from exile. Yet it's interesting to note that Psalm 90 was written by Moses, Moses for that matter, and so were the children of Israel, exiled for a while or found themselves in exile in Egypt, and of course Moses in the land of Midian. Also, Psalms 106 is credited with King David, a king whom himself was exalted or exiled from Israel not just once but twice. First, before he became a king, when he had to live with the Philistines, which kind of blows your mind away when you think about it. And then later, when he is king, when he has to go and live with his, or escape, excuse me, escape from his son, Absalom, who is trying to take over the kingdom. So also one last note, book four departs from book three in that the book three focuses on the frailty of humanity while book four focuses on God's everlasting reign. But our scripture scripture reading will come from the book of Isaiah as I mentioned a moment ago. I believe during this weekend of Thanksgiving, Isaiah chapter 25 verse 4 is a fitting scripture describing what God has done for us all. Thus our hearts can be full of gladness, joy, and thanksgiving because of what God has done for us. So let us read Isaiah chapter 25 verse 4 together. Isaiah chapter 25 Verse 4 together. For you have been a strength to the poor, strength to the needy in distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat. For the blast of the terrible ones is a storm against the wall. Who of us here today cannot relate to that verse? In Isaiah 25, I'll repeat it one more time. For you have been a strength to the poor. This is referring to what God has done for those that are poor in faith, poor in spirit, poor in stature, poor financially, doesn't matter. God is there, strength to the needy in distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, For the blast of the terrible ones is a storm against the wall. In other words, they're hitting up against God instead of hitting us. What a beautiful promise in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 4. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our dear, kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity be able to open the scriptures and examine them and see what kind of love that you have for us. So this morning as we enter into our study, I ask that I be emptied of self and that the hearts of those that are here watching online or here in the sanctuaries across this district, that our hearts will be open and that your Holy Spirit will fill us with wisdom and understanding and that my my words will be your words in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to put up on the screen a picture here in just a moment. In May, 
of 1965, a series of six tornadoes ripped through the northern suburbs of Minneapolis and St. Paul. These series of six tornadoes are known as the Fridley tornadoes. One of the six, or excuse me, yeah, one of the six, or of the six, excuse me, of the six tornadoes, three or two were F3 tornadoes, while the other four were categorized as F4 tornadoes. You can understand the strength of those particular tornadoes. It was the sixth and final tornado on this faithful night that destroyed the neighborhood where my aunt and uncle and five cousins lived in Moundsview, Minnesota. It was the largest and the last of the six tornadoes that destroyed the homes and businesses, forever changing the lives of the people on that fateful night. My uncle, and I'm going to put up on the screen so that you can all see it here because this is really quite the picture. This is a picture of the destruction that took place. I hope it's the picture of the destruction that took place. I will put it up on the screen here in just a second for you. Oh, my screen is froze. I am so sorry, people. Let's try that again. No, I'm not going to be able to get it. That's a shame. Oh, I almost had it. Let's try it again. There we go. We got it. Sorry about that. So there is the destruction of the wake of the tornado. Uh, it appears, if I can figure out this picture good enough, that in the very lower part of that, ho that picture, there's two houses that remain standing. One of those houses was my aunt and uncle's house. And the other one was their neighbors, the White Necks. My aunt and uncle's house remained standing, as you can see, but it was condemned as it looked like a bomb had exploded inside the house, blowing all four walls out or bowing all four walls out, making it unsafe. What's really interesting is that my cousin Marv had gotten a glass of milk just as the tornado was hitting and had left the refrigerator door a crack, open just a crack, and all the windows blew into the house, but all the glass from the windows was deposited inside that refrigerator. Another interesting thing is that there was a salt and pepper shaker on the table with a pretty little napkin underneath it, and despite all the destruction and, and whatnot around them, the salt and pepper shaker were right where they were on the table, and that napkin was just perfectly laying there as though nothing had ever happened. From the basement window, my uncle looked out to see their new car hovering about 10, oh, 10 to 12 feet off the ground, only to be slammed down into the driveway, breaking all the springs in the car. Another interesting fact is when the tornado was over, they no longer had transportation, and they were wondering what to do, and so they walked a mile and a half from their house through the destruction and debris to a brand new set of apartment buildings that had just been built, and they were able to stay the night in those apartment buildings and were able to rent an apartment while their house was being redone. And I'll show you a picture here of the house that was redone. This is a modern day, taken just a couple, three months ago picture. They just recently put the house up for sale and sold it. Uh, my cousins did, my aunt is still alive, my uncle has passed away. So, My aunt and uncle and the entire family were God-loving and faithful Christians, as were so many on that fateful night in May, yet 
they, like so many others, suddenly found their lives shattered, swept away by the winds. They questioned, as many did, how is it that we, as Christians, have to suffer such terrible, terrible things such as this tornado? And at the beginning of the pandemic, people asked, many people asked the same question as the people began to die. Many sought refuge in the Bible. Many re readers read and then memorized the 91st Psalm, giving them hope during a difficult time. The heading in my Bible for the 91st Psalm is safety of abiding in, a, in the presence of God. It's a fitting title for this. We try and apply it in a certain way. This morning, I would like to re-examine this psalm. What did the author of this psalm want his readers during his time to see? Then we should ask ourselves the question, does it apply in any way to us today? Psalms 89, which ends the third book, focuses on human frailty and God's relentless wrath. And I want to be careful here on how we state and understand God's relentless wrath because God does not pour out his anger as we often think. God's wrath is actually displayed in a different way by his stepping back and allowing the natural consequences of sin to take their place. God will often step back, curtailing or limiting what happens. But God's wrath is a little bit different because how can a loving God that sent his son to die on the cross, who Jesus himself willingly gave himself for us, all of heaven emptied itself for our salvation, how can we then say that this God that demonstrated such love is taking out vengeance upon others. God's wrath is stated strangely because I don't think the Bible authors necessarily had the correct words to describe it, or even in some cases, maybe the correct understanding. God's wrath is when God steps back and allows the natural consequences of sin to take place, and we see that in the flood, and I'm using up a lot of valuable time here. Yet Psalms 98 departs from Psalms 89 in, reinfor in reinforcing the focus of God as the ultimate refuge for his people, which is the theme book, the theme of book four of the Psalms, God's everlasting reign in contrast to failed human rule that we see in book th three. Therefore, Psalms 91 encourages believers to trust in the numerous promises of God's protection and blessing. A divine oracle marks confidence in God's will and promises as seen in the closing of verses 91, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, the many terms and imagery of protection, shelter, and refuge underscores the theme, but the psalm is also a reference as to a song of trust and wisdom, or simply a psalm of confidence in the Lord. Psalm 90 laments human transience, whereas Psalms 91 promises long life and salvation to those who trust in the Lord. So let's turn to Psalms 91 as we go through it today. Let's turn to Psalms 91. We're not going to read through this all in one setting. We're going to break this into little sections and do it this way. There are some fascinating information here. Psalms 91. Here we go. You ready? Psalms 91. 
He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord in verse 2, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. It's really interesting when you look at those first two verses. There are four references to shelter. And there are four references to name. Whomever the psalmist is, he wants you to see that he has an intimate understanding of God and what God can provide. Four words, as I mentioned a moment ago, indicate divine protection. They are secret place, shadow, refuge, and fortress. He uses, and then he uses four different names for God. They are the Most High, the Almighty, the Lord, and God. These are the four names of God. So in two short verses, which are 13 words in Hebrew, the psalmist tells of the Most High, Elion, the Almighty, Shaddai, the Lord, Yahweh, and God, Elohim. Only someone with an intimate knowledge of God would use four different words or names to describe him. <coughs> but the author also wants us to see the surpassing greatness of God, the God of Israel. Therefore, he tells of the security that one can find in God, which is the secret place the shadow, the refuge, and the for f fortress. But now the psalmist demonstrates how divine protection works in relation to the people's specific challenges and trials that they will meet. God's miraculous protection extends to every possible situation that would endanger his people, as we will see in verses 3 through 8. Let's read them together. Verses 3 through 8. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from his perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings. He shall take refuge. He shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrows that fly by day, nor of the pestilence that walk in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it is but it shall come, but it shall not come near you. And then verse 8, Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Put that last phrase on your mental shelf for a moment. The reward of the wicked, or only with your eyes shall you see, you look and see the reward of the wicked. Put that in your mental shelf. We're going to come back to this in a moment. As a result of the tornado that took place, it affected my uncle tremendously. So much so, and it's hard to see in that picture that I put up of the Beatty family house, but there's an extension on the back of the house, and underneath that extension, he went to the trouble of building a storm shelter just in case another tornado like that should ever happen again. I often wondered how much he believed and trusted in Psalms 91, but as I've gone through Psalms 91, my understanding of it has changed from what I have understood before, and we're going to get into that in just a moment. Looking at the verses we just read, while the first two verses tell of an intimate relationship with God and give us information about the protection God offers, these six verses describe the condition of the people of God and the condition that they're in and the condition that God often finds them in. These six verses 
gives stark contrast to what we see in the first two verses. But these six verses also contain a mountain of hope. What's interesting is in verse 3, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of a fowler, of the fowler. Verse 3 contains an interesting statement. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. You and I think of this as one throwing out a net to catch birds. But verse 4 uses the analogy of covering with his feathers as a hope for the condition stated in verse 3. If the fowler is trying to catch birds, you wouldn't use the analogy of being covered by feathers. <coughs> Therefore, the verse is stating something totally and completely different, yet many have stated that Satan sets his snare, his snares for the children of God. But let's add verses 5, 6 to verse 3, and verse 5 says, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. What the author is wanting us to understand and know is ancient pagan cultures, and increasingly today, as we look around in society, many are repl- relying upon other means other than God for protection. Ezekiel the prophet, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel the prophet in chapter 13, verses 17 to 21, introduces an interesting concept that allows us to better understand what's being referred here. Next, Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 17 through 21. I'll read it to you out of the New King James Version. Likewise, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people who prophesy out of their own heart, prophesy against them. And say, thus says the Lord God, Woe to the women who sew magic charms on their sleeves and make veils for their heads, for the heads of people of every height to hunt souls. Will you hunt the soul of my people and keep yourselves alive? And will you profane me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread, killing people who should not die and keeping people alive who should not be alive? By your lying to my people who listen to these lies. Verse 20, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against your magic charms by which you hunt souls there like birds. I will tear them from your arms and let the souls go to the souls you hunt like birds. I will also tear off your veils and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall no longer be prey in your hand. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. What's being taken and described here is something really interesting. It's talking about witchcraft and mediums and seers and sorcerers and all, all these different items tricking the people into believing that they're actually chasing after people that have already died and how this is so dangerous to the people of God. And the Israelites, of course, were told that they weren't supposed to do that. But although these practices have become relevant or prevalent in Israel, they were forbidden. And the prophet Ezekiel is saying, um, They will not give you comfort, people. Those that practice such things will not make you comfortable. Those that practice such things are like those hunting birds. But Ezekiel ends by saying God would clean them of this, as he promised in verse 30, or in Psalms 91, verses 3 and 4, where he delivers and covers those he trusts that trust in him. The image of God's wings alludes to the protection of a mother bird 
or the wings of the cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant in the sanctuary. The secret place, by the way, is a reference to the most holy place in the sanctuary where the Ark of the Covenant was and the two cherubims were on either side. So as the two angels of the Ark of the Covenant fold their wing, those who place themselves upon the mercies of God will be protected by the wings of the covering cherub. Therefore, the people of God, the faithful of God, are shielded by God's awesome holiness and majesty so that no evil, no human or supernatural power can approach. God's protection is so sure that it works against all odds, as we see in verses 7 and 9. Verse 9 states, Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, the author is inviting you to experience what he himself has experienced. And for those who have placed their lives upon the mercies of God, its psalmist seeks to encourage and reaffirm those safely protected on the wings of the covering cherub. As my aunt and uncle found out during the awful night of May of 1965, human places of habitation are perishable. However, the Lord is a never-failing refuge because He is the everlasting God. As the psalmist assurance and certain of these things because He has personally experienced them, therefore he declares the Lord is his refuge. Verses 9 through 10. Let's read them together. Verses 9 through 10. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent shall trample underfoot. In Psalms 91, verses 3 through 8, the various forms of God's protection are given. Now in verses 10 through 13, they are once again spelled out. This time God seems where he seemed personal before, he seems more remote at this point because he's involved in the affairs of the disciples. He's using the disciples in order to administer that which he's promised to do before. Therefore, he orders his angels to watch over, and he has empowered them to participate in the protection of the saints. But it goes deeper than this. For through the power of the Holy Spirit, those who are given to the Lord are given the power to tread upon lions and cobras. And one day, one day soon, I hope, Christ will tread upon Satan and evil, and they will exist no more. Therefore, this is not a passive recipient of divine participation or protection in verses 11 through 13. Yet the intimacy is still there, just like it was in the mother hen that covers the chicks in verse 4. Here the angels bear the ones who trust in God. They bear them in their hands to protect them from striking uh, their foot against a stone. In a beautiful phrase, he shall give his angels charge over you. The psalmist supports his summons with new protective images. The image of angels carrying the faithful on their, on, in their hands demonstrates God's special care that is paralleled by the warm touch of God's wings in verse 4. And dashing one's foot against a stone is a metaphor for various types of misfortune that can affect us all. In our last three verses, let's read them together. 
because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The psalmist's testimony up to this point has been powerful, powerful enough to convince his audience of the greatness of God and God's ref- refuge. But God himself answers and confirms the psalmist's witness in the last three verses. The phrase, he has set his love upon me, tell us to set one's love upon God, a love that will not let go. In other words, it's an invitation for us to cleave on to, grab a hold of God, the type of love that becomes a deep inward attachment to God and is described descriptive of God's love toward Israel. So God's asking us to love him the way he, God, loved Israel. In other words, to know one's name indicates a familiarity and knowledge of the other person's of the other person. To know God's name implies here that The author has an intimate knowledge of God and God's character that leads to complete surrender to him, and the invitation is for us to do the same. (coughs) God always has always wanted a relationship with us, but is the psalmist's cleaving and yearning and desiring that binds Yahweh to the psalmist. But what is amazing about this psalm is that it describes the conditions just before the second coming throughout eternity. Because the psalm describes the Lord bringing wickedness to an end, which gives assurance to his people of his care and protection and reward for the long time, for a long time to come when God eradicates evil and brings it to an end. Circumstances in our life today do not always match what is being described in the psalm. For many, my aunt and uncle and others, a thousand others, circumstances on that fateful night caused them to question their belief in God And circumstances today often cause us to question our belief in God. But placing our total faith and dependence upon God today does assure us of God's protection and mercies when he brings evil to an end. As the earth is destroyed and finally made new, all who trust in God will be saved as a mother hen broods over her chicks. Therefore, we can all be thankful to God who has promised us safety and protection from what the wicked will experience when the evil shall become no more. What I hope that is ours, what a hope is ours, all are available when we cleave unto God. How thankful the people of God can be for the safety and reward that we will experience before his second coming and and before the earth is made new. God loves us with an everlasting love, and he wants us to love him the exact same way. Therefore, Therefore, the 91st Psalm is to give us assurance that evil of this world is coming to an end. Be careful of all these magical charms and other stuff that are offering protection. The only true protection comes from God. 
and he invites us to participate by cleaving on to him, thus throwing ourselves on the mercy seat in God's secret place, his refuge. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our dear, kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open the scriptures together and to be able to get a clearer understanding of what this psalm is trying to tell us, and it's a beautiful psalm. It's not saying that the things that are happening around us is necessarily we're going to be protected and shielded from. What it's trying to say is when, when sin and evil is finally rooted out, God will be protecting us from the events that take place around us at that time. What a beautiful promise, and this is a promise that should cause us all to be thankful that you have promised to protect us when the time of trouble comes and during the time that the earth is made new. We ask this in your holy and precious name that you will continue to guide and direct in our lives and that the hearts of each and every one of us will be open and cleave unto you. In Jesus' name, amen.